it's Writing Wednesday Book Talk, and this week I'm here on the deck of my family's old home in Coley's Point, Newfoundland. This is the same house that inspired Triffy and Jacob John's house in the novel That Forgetful Sure, and I'm here today to talk not about my book, but about a different Newfoundland historical novel, one I would have given my eye teeth to be able to write. I'm talking about Michael Crummy's novel, Galore. Galore is a sweeping epic that covers the life of a Newfoundland outport community over the span of about a century. It's really hard for me to talk about this book without using the words sweeping and epic over and over again. I describe this as a historical novel with a touch of magic realism thrown in. Galore is a book that does a wonderful job of bringing to life a huge cast of characters and of exploring not just the characters as individuals but also the complex web of... Uh, relationships, things like the religious and social class differences that unite and divide them, situating them in a vividly realized natural landscape, and also giving us a sense of how that community, if the fictional town of Paradise Deep, is connected to the outside world. At the beginning of the novel, Paradise Deep is so isolated from the rest of the world that the novel could almost be taking place on another planet. But by the end of the novel, a hundred years later, you're getting a sense of how that community and its inhabitants are being drawn into the wider world of Newfoundland and the rest of the British Empire. Those connections are being made, and that seems to me very realistic uh, for how life must have been during the 19th century in a lot of these very isolated Places. As I said, my goal in this series is to talk about books I love, not just what I love about them as a reader, but also as a writer. And what I want to talk about with Galore, what Michael Crummy does so brilliantly, is the use of language. I really think Michael Crummy is one of the best practitioners of language or handlers of language that we have in Canadian writing today. And this is so on display in Galore, where his words have so much work to do. I mean, they have to carry, both in the narration and in the dialogue, this sense of not just telling the story, but telling it in a way that seems mythic or almost folkloric, uh, and also to create a sense of the flavor of the language of the place without ever slipping into or resorting to those uh, Newfie dialect stereotypes I was talking about a couple of weeks ago. So to illustrate this, I want to just look at a couple of passages that I think are so brilliant. One is narration, very near the beginning of the novel, uh, as it's setting the scene. Mary Trefina was a child when she first laid eyes on the man. A lifetime passed. End of April and the ice just gone from the bay. Most of the shore's meager population, the Irish and West Country English, and the Bushborns of uncertain provenance, were camped on the grey sand, waiting to butcher a whale that had beached itself in the shallows on the feast day of St. Mark. This during a time of scarcity, when the ocean was barren, and gardens went to rot in the relentless rain, and each winter threatened to bury them all. They weren't whalers, and no one knew how to go about killing the Leviathan, but there was something in the humpback's unexpected offering that prevented the starving men from hacking away while the fish still breathed, as if that would be a desecration of the gift. I just love the use of language, the, the lilt and flow of it, and the throwing in of words like provenance and Leviathan uh, in a way that's not at all heavy-handed, but just sounds almost biblical. The second is a passage of dialogue from much later in the novel where a priest is visiting a woman who is being haunted by the ghost of her dead husband. The priest turned to Divine's widow. You've an opinion on this, missus. He wants something of that woman, I'd say, and there's no one else alive or dead can give it to him. Do you not know what to do, Father? Lizzie asked. The dead are more like mortal creatures than we know, he said. Each one rises to a different bait. The priest set out early the next morning and walked to the house in the droke. Mrs. Gallery didn't get up from the table, calling him in from where she sat. Her husband, that's the ghost of the husband, occupied his usual chair by the fire, huddling close to the flames as if against a draft. He's forever cold, Mrs. Gallery said. I think sometimes he might sit his arse right in the fire to try and get warm. There's fire galore awaiting him elsewhere, Father Phelan said. Does he talk to you at all? He talks only to himself and I can't pick out a word of it. I hope those two examples give you a sense of what I think is so great about this novel. Not only that it tells a beautiful story, but that it tells it beautifully. And the way Michael Crummy handles language is the way that I think all writers should aspire to. So that's my pick for this week. I'll be back next week in a different place with a different book. I'm going to be talking about a novel called My Name is Asher Lev by American novelist Chaim Potok. And I'll see you then.